produce pitches and sounds and things. Um, I took some pictures of the class and some pictures of the project itself, and I'll just kind of talk through what it's like. Um, if we can go to the first slide of Tracy. So I made this and posted it on uh, Mattermost of my setup. Um, Billy had one that he posted as well, and Isaac did as well, of their own microscope, digital microscope setups that let them view, I mean, down to where the soldering iron tip was as big as my finger on the screen. Uh, really cool. Everybody, the five people or so that were in the class had a different setup each. Um, this class was, the point of this class was to practice and learn surface mount components, which are, we'll see them in a second, very, very small packaged uh, resistors, capacitors, uh, timers, uh, integrated circuits. Um, there are lots of them, and I'm not an expert at this, but it was a an opportunity to practice installing them on a circuit board with the correct amount of solder, the correct amount of heat, kind of advanced circuit construction versus the big resistors that you can see in holding your fingers. These are exceedingly small. So let's go to the first next one. The first next one. That's it. Good, Zach. Um, these are the, the packages that we received them in. They are um, automatic paper and plastic uh, holders that are used for automated installation by computers and robots. But we just peel the plastic off and dump out these little components. You can see the size of my index finger, how small we're talking about. The ones directly below my finger are the smallest. They're called 0603. I'm reading this off the board. The next size up is the one that has 0 0.1 upside down. Those are 0805s. The biggest ones are 1206s. Um, the next picture, that, that is some solder, by the way, directly below my finger. That's the size of solder we used. That's desoldering braid, which you use to remove extra solder from the board because you can't really chip it off. You melt it and it sucks up into the copper. It's really cool. All right, the next picture, please. Um, this is an example of, I love Knox makers so much and I really appreciate someone in particular. I appreciate everybody, but the one person in Knox makers, I think, and he's very humble, so I'm able to mention him, is Mr. Ray Crampton. Ray Crampton's genius of creating classes and neat little kits for our class, or our whole group, includes this particular element. Those are practice spots that he built into the board with little silver squares that we use to practice installing components. Those are not connected mechanically or electrically to anything. It's just an opportunity for us to practice the mechanics of soldering. So if you get the opportunity to take an electronics class, I encourage you to take it. Ray's design and Isaac's teaching methodologies are brilliant and they really helped all of us um, gain a lot of experience. The next one, this is the smallest size we worked with. You can see how just flipping small these tiny things are. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That's great. <laughs> They're okay. <laughs> um, the next picture is probably 0805. Yep, that's the next biggest size. Uh, it's just small, y'all. And the next one is 1206. It's just small. They're all tiny. Um, but this gave us an opportunity to tweeze them to mount the first pad, melt it, let it fall, and melt the second pad on. Brilliant design. Thanks to Ray and Isaac for bringing that in. All right, then um, I didn't take pictures of the rest of the installation because it was just all so tiny, but the next one should be a picture of the completed project. Uh, oh, the back of the board. This is how we mounted the speaker with, with some hot glue, some wires, and that pad just helps hold the battery in place. I used some cardboard to isolate it from some electrical circuits and some double-sided sticky tape so I can just do that and it stays on the back of the board. Um, they also included some little uprights so it just sits flat. And the next one is a picture of the front of the completed project. I love the monikers, ooh, yeah, and baby. They don't mean anything, but they're just a lot of fun. Um, so cover your ears. I'm gonna turn it on. <laughs> Uh, this is what it looks like, and you go, and, you... and my cat's just skedaddled. That's great. But <laughs> it's I a timer circuit. It, it, it changes pitch and volume and some other resonating qualities. It's just fun. It's not really functional necessarily, except uh, fun electronics and sound thing. But anyway, I encourage you all to take the class. Yeah, the classes are awesome. I encourage you all to just take them. They're worth the time. Thank you, Zach. Yep. That was great. I'm glad I got to see one in all its annoying glory.
Uh, next up, we have Tim, who has a puzzle for us. Let's see if I can get the camera running. Okay, you can advance, please. So this was a kit that I got over uh, Christmas. Uh, I think it was Metal City Works or something like that. Uh, the end result is an RC Bobcat that actually works. Uh, the bucket moves up and down, tilts the whole nine yards. It's got tracks, it can roll around, and it does everything that a real one can actually do, just at a much, 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 much smaller scale. Um, but this thing came in almost 1,300 parts. Oh, my. And uh, it has all of these little parts, and you can advance it again. And these are the main structure of it. It's kind of like an old-school erector set. Um, you even have to assemble the planetary gears in the little black gearbox that you can see up in the upper right corner um, in order to put the motor around that and... Uh, Pro tip, this is something I actually did and had verified that they were working. Make sure all your motors are working before you spend seven hours putting together a, you know, this kind of a kit and then find out that, you know, some of them aren't and you have to take most of it back apart. In this case, they all were working, but I did have to take it apart because I put them on too tight. You can go again. And these are just more of the small parts. Uh, I ended up using like four different bins to organize everything because they just came in one big bag. So that was a lot of fun to sort that. It took nearly an hour just to sort all of these things. Uh, one more. And these are all the screws and tiny little hardware that it uh, had. <clears throat> these are probably 1.5 millimeter screws. I mean, they are really, really, really small. Uh, you basically are taking them out of these bins with tweezers and you're putting them on the machine with tweezers, but it actually came with uh, tools that are pretty good and worked very well for you know, assembling virtually everything on this, uh, if you can advance it. And that's just the other stuff that you'd seen uh, more sorted. Uh, the electronics package is down in the lower right corner with the little battery in the center with a little black thing that's below the two silver wheels that's actually one of the motor assemblies uh, this used to be much much more full i had taken this picture after i had the machine probably three quarters assembled uh, before then the whole thing was overflowing with little tiny parts and i think that on the next one it starts the actual assembly of the machine and at this point you can probably just advance it every couple of uh, seconds and i'll just kind of talk as we go through and if there's something that i spot uh, that needs to be talked about we'll stop you uh, but you can see here you got the gearbox for the motor and then they actually have like three stages of gears for some of these things and some of them are just direct drive and uh, things like that but you can literally just go ahead about one a second on advancing them um, you're just building up the body here and that's the back side of the same thing uh, this is just more assembly you can see the tools the little red handled things there on the right side uh, it's just, it was a fun little kit to put together, but as you can see, as you're going through here, it's getting more and more complex as you're going. And this is just one side. Uh, right. You have to build this whole thing over again after you finish this one. And then you have to build something probably three times more complex for the center after you get all of this done. We're still working on just one side here. Okay, now if you stop for this one. This is where I've got both sides together and you can see all of the stuff in the center and the gears and everything. And I, we're not even close to being done yet. Um, all of this is getting to where you actually will be able to put the uh, drive wheels on. And uh, you had to, they, for some reason, had you sort of start the drive wheels earlier when you were doing each individual side. But one of them you actually had to finish while it was in this state. And that was an absolute nightmare to get into. If you oh, can nice. advance it. <clears throat> So here we're just a little bit further along. I've got the drive wheels on. You can see they're the uh, ones with the little spikes on the sides. And uh, you can advance it again. And this is just more of the finished product. Here's probably close to the final, final product. Uh, it's got the canopy over the top of it. And the last picture was probably the point where you needed to check all of your motors again. But I just trucked right along to the end and found out later that I should have stopped it earlier and checked all of my motors one more time. Oh, you no. can keep on going. 
And this is uh, the little bucket that it originally came with is the one that's in the right uh, side there that's unfolded. That's just an extremely thin little sheet of plastic. Um, I modeled it and 3D printed it uh, to make the one on the left because I read that um, it set about 10 millimeters too high for it to actually hit the ground when the machine was all the way down. And I wanted to adjust it so that the whole thing would be 10 millimeters lower. I actually went with 15 because I wanted to have a little bit of extra. Um, but I modeled that, printed it, and then kept going. So if you can advance it. And this is the bucket assembly. It both will raise on the back part and the part that's up near the actual bucket itself is what tilts the bucket backwards and forwards uh, when you attach this to the uh, machine itself. So you can keep going. And that's pretty much one of the nearly finished products at this point. It all works, uh, except for the fact that the drive motor that you can see here was binding and I had to take the canopy off of it in order to get in there and uh, also take the motor in front of that motor out in order to be able to loosen two nuts enough to get that motor to start spinning. And, you know, that's one of those things that they could have mentioned, don't tighten it too much. And uh, in every other place that something moved, they actually included nylon uh, nuts instead of metal ones. And had they even had enough extra to put on every one of the four motor mounts. And they simply said, use a nylon nut instead of a metal one, this problem wouldn't have happened because it would have just shifted enough to allow it to move. But with the metal ones, you know, it's natural instinct. You don't want it moving, you tighten it down. Are you gonna go again? And these are the tracks. Uh, there are three pieces, the little uh, dual spiky guy that you see there that's still in its uh, cage and the ones that I've already cut off. Yeah, and then off to the right side of that, um, you've got these which link the pieces together and somewhere buried in that there are end caps. So you'll put one of the spike things and then two of the links and two of the end caps on each spike for 30 different ones going around for just one track. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you can advance it again. And then that's what it actually looks like with the tracks on. And it's pretty well done other than uh, just some cable management. But uh, the machine does fully work at this point and it drives around and, you know, you can goof off with it or just do whatever you want to with it. It's something fun to just have on your desk and play with whenever you're, you know, mind numbingly bored from your job. I think there's... <laughs> oh, that never happens. No, it never happens, especially if my boss is on there. You can advance so it one how more. many TV shows did you binge watch putting this together? Uh, I think just one. It uh, I did it over a course of you know several days, but uh, all in all, it probably took about six and a half to seven hours. Uh, oh, including, that's a lot less than I thought. <laughs> yeah, including going back and taking some of it apart. But uh, it was a lot of fun, and the company that makes these, uh, they make a um, whole bunch of different ones. They've got a crane. Uh, I got the kit from Banggood, and uh, it's just under their RC stuff, but they've got a dump truck, they've got a crane, uh, they got this, and I want to say there's one other one that they've got, And uh, but this one looked like it was the most, you know, fun, and it was small enough to actually still do something with, but the cool thing is they're fully RC, and uh, they, they claim that this is something for a six-plus-year-old to, you know, build, obviously, with a parent helping, because I would think that a six-year-old would rage quit on this thing way before I ever did. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and all the pieces would be all over your floor. That would be, well, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I dropped more than one of the screws and had to use a magnet to fish it out of the carpet because they're so small. Mm -hmm. So, but, yep, it Very was a lot nice. of fun to put together, cool. and, you know, it's fun, fun to play with afterwards. And if we wanted to... Uh, take longer than the entire bout, we could use it to clean the kill switch arena between fights. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Make it go faster. Just put a new motor on it. Yeah. Yeah. Put some of the uh, brushless motors on there. <laughs> it can be Maybe your make, a, robot. make the bucket metal and actually enter it into the competition. <laughs> Sounds good. Is that the last slide? Yeah, I yes. believe so. Thank you. That was really cool. You should uh, post the link somewhere. That's really neat. I'll uh, stick them in the uh, uh, off topic on Mattermost. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Sean. Hello. Hello. 
Um, yeah, so I am showing off paint storage. Um, I posted this in the Arts and Crafts Zone channel not too long ago. Yes, lasers are involved in this. Um, basically, I uh, had this idea to move some things out of the boxes that are stored up on the shelves there and get them out in the open where they're more visible. One of the most uh, egregious uh, violators of this was the paint, paint storage for just a bunch of bottles thrown into uh, a bin and it was really hard to tell what was actually in there and stuff was empty enough. So I went through the paint bin and pulled out all the small ones and wouldn't you know it, there was almost, almost exactly uh, uh, five times 12 uh, bottles there and roughly um, grouped into similar colors and I said, ah, I remember seeing this thing from, I don't know, maybe a month or two back uh, that somebody had made a laser cut box using um, boxes.py, box, boxes pi, whatever it's called. Um, but it basically was an open source box generator that you could go on and just plug in what you needed. And yeah, exactly, but John Dell just has it down there in the, uh, in the chat. Um, and I had remember, remembered seeing paint storage was an option there, so I went in and uh, optimized um, the design to hold these uh, these specific ones, you know, measured them up and then uh, measured the cart, the new art cart. And I don't know if you go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so the art cart that we had was, you know, 10, about the base was about 10 inches wide. And I knew I had, um, you know, certain, certain, dimensions to work with there. So basically I just plugged in how long it needed to be, how wide, and it spit out this rack that was, uh, could hold 12, 12 pots in there. And uh, so yeah, just you know, did a test run on cardboard. And if you go back to the previous one, uh, once I made sure that they were all gonna fit together, cut it out of the wood, and then they stack by, I didn't take a great angle on this, but uh, basically everything here was pretty good enough. It was the first time I'd ever used Moonraker and it was pretty good uh, to press fit. So every I didn't have to glue the actual racks together because they're not like they uh, have a lot of um, weight on them or, or undue forces. If they do fall apart, please let me know um, because then I will glue them together. But they really, they, they're pretty snug. So I didn't, uh, and I was anxious to kind of see how they look stacked together and so the only things I actually had to uh, glue I don't know if you could zoom in maybe on the right side you could see it best um, yeah so the only thing I had to glue were those little tabs there in between the um, in between the individual trays yeah exactly and they were just these little just literally just little tab you know look like popsicle stick type things cut out of there and that's basically what helps it to stack because it has a uh, right it has a little yeah, exactly. So they, they spot in, that. and then That's the bottom of it has the exact same shape. And then you put the little tab on the back there so that it doesn't have any side to side motion. And they're pretty solid. I mean, those those stacked up three high without, you know, not shaking at all. Um, and so, yeah, they're pretty sturdy, and I'm really happy with them. The only thing is, I might have made them uh, a little too exacting. Um, with the diameter because if a paint bottle is warped at all, it becomes wider in some directions and thinner in some. So getting it in there is really tough. Um, <laughs> and lasers, this is a, a rare occasion when lasers makes an appearance in, uh, in arts and crafts. Um, but they worked really well and uh, I will actually be using the laser cutter to make some brush storage uh, options. I was, it was late. So I have another design for that coming up. But yeah, so if these uh, fall apart, do let me know. But otherwise, they're pretty cool, and you can find these now on the uh, on the art cart. And they're generally organized by color. Um, like there were enough blues to make a, a all blue, uh, and the blacks and grays and whites, those all fit together. Um, so yeah, try to keep them roughly organized in that regard because uh, they look really nice. But yeah, so now this is a new addition and I'm really happy with how they came out and it didn't take that long at all. That's neat. I'll have to check out that box's website. I didn't know it there had are, a variety. There are a ton of things on there. I mean, there are huh. 
trays and tray inserts. And so, yeah, there's lots of different uh, options for different boxes and shelves and just other cool stuff too. Just, you know, they have like a whole miscellaneous thing that's like, you, you can cut out a thing to stack bottles. And, and so it's pretty cool. And uh, definitely gonna be making some other stuff uh, from there for storage in the future, but yeah, pretty cool. cool. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, and the link is in the chat now. Nice. Thank you, Andrew, for putting the link there. Next, we have Nate. This is Knoxville Art. The camera, Nate, I can't remember. Yes, Hello. there you are. Hi. Um, so, my name is Nate. I'm a packaging designer and I'm really new to Knoxville. I've only been here for two months, but I uh, I wrapped up this project that I was given at work and I put it online and uh, made a comment about how I wanted to use a laser cutter to make one of these out of wood. And someone made a suggestion I should get in touch with you guys. So here I am. Here we are. And Sean showed us what you can make with the laser. So let's see so, what you made. This is my Knoxville skyline out of corrugated cardboard project. Just let um, me know when to go to the next slide. Please. Okay. Um, so the two main softwares I used for this are RDOS CAD and Adobe Illustrator. Um, RDOS CAD is kind of niche. It's a 2D based CAD designing program that's the industry standard for like folding cartons and corrugated boxes so paper-based packaging products and adobe illustrator is just the uh you know the graphic design program and i mainly use that because um rdo's cad is kind of archaic and it doesn't really handle arcs that well and if you get too many of them in the same drawing it'll crash the program so uh yeah, most of my font work and you know art creation was made in adobe illustrator um next slide please so in the equipment that i used for this is a, a kongsberg cutting table and this is another kind of niche machine for the packaging industry it's essentially it's like a cnc router with a really nice exacto blade on it among other features and things and um, it's got a giant vacuum area on the bottom of the table that keeps the board you know in place when it's cutting and creasing the board and uh yeah this was a big help for this project because it takes a lot of work out of how out big of is that um, this one's pretty big. It's. Uh, is this like a normal standard computer monitor in the back? Yes. It, it's oh, wow. About so that is quite large. Pickup truck, probably. Oh, wow. So, nice. That's got to be fun to, to play around with. <laughs> yeah, you can make some, some pretty cool, but it's pretty limited to paper based stuff. Right. But uh, yeah, that's what I used for this project. And um, now I'll tell you how I went about doing it. Um, so my first step with taking on anything like this where I haven't really uh, done before is I Google it just to see what other people have done in the past and see what works. And uh, so yeah, when I Google Knoxville skyline silhouettes, there's plenty of uh, existing things that come up. And so it's good to, for me to just, you know, brush through what's out there and kind of uh, pay attention to what I liked and kind of keep that in mind that I'll need to uh, work within the size limitations and how thin you could cut the cardboard before it just tears up. So um, yeah, with that, I made some selections. If you will go to the next slide, I'll let you know which ones I chose. So to make it a proper skyline i uh went with the two tallest buildings that i could find uh so those are there in the top left corner 
And then I didn't want to make it too busy and have too many buildings around. So and for the rest of the ones, I just chose the, uh, you know, the more iconic structures with the most unique and identifiable profiles. So that's the other four. And um, then once I made my selections, I uh, set my size limitations and just got drawing. And this was the, the most fun part because I just have two monitors and I'll be, you know, referencing one and then just drawing one on the other. And um, it took a good bit of trial and error and just moving things around and figuring out where I wanted to place. But this is uh, the layout that I came up with and this is in Partios CAD. Uh, after that, I uh, give the next slide. I made a cut and uh, placed them all on top of each other and then kind of critiqued it to see what, I don't know, what I liked, what I didn't like, and what I needed to add or change to, uh, I don't know, move this thing forward. And so uh, the first thing I noticed is that there's a lot of area that I need to fill up with this 45 by 30 inch profile to work with. So that's all that blue up there. And uh, I wasn't really sure how to do it at first, but I got brainstorming later. Another thing that I wanted to do is the, uh, I wanted to add some back supports for each of the different layers of the different structures that I was featuring because right now they're just independent. So they'd just be like flopping around and there's nothing to hold them down really. And uh, another thing was I, uh, I didn't really care for the font that I used in this first one. It was just a stock cursive font that was in the uh, Adobe suite. And uh, so I wanted to change that out too. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here's what I came up with for uh, building the supports for each layer. I uh, kind of started with the backmost layer and then, you know, put in every feature and then took one out for each layer I'd be moving up. And with the, uh, the sun sphere by itself on the top, because that one was the trickiest and the easiest to, I don't know, for the table to just chew up because there's so many different holes. And um, sorry, this slide's kind of messy, but uh, just wanted to give a shout out to defont.com. Oh yeah, it's that place a, is great. Yeah, it's really good if you, you know, just looking for the right font for your job. And uh, I was able to, to scroll around for hours. <laughs> oh yeah, but, but I settled on this cream cake font because um, I don't know, it's a little, it's cleaner than the other one. And it's also got some, you know, meat on it. It's thicker, so it wouldn't get chewed up as much. And it's all pretty much connected, or at least I made it connected when I finally made the cut. Um, and then there's just a series of commands for how I uh, brought it into Adobe Illustrator and then export it out to get into RDOS CAD so I could be able to cut it. Um, so this is where I started filling the background of the skyline. I uh, thought the easiest and I don't know, most appropriate thing was to throw some like, rolling hills, some mountains in the background, but that only did about half the job. And uh, then I took some inspiration from a previous design I'd made in the past for a sunset style, I don't know, wavy, tight sunset and uh, I did that and put through that behind the mountains and I was pretty satisfied with that. But the, uh, the open sun, it, it would have been all white. And I don't know, I, I didn't think it really looked quite right when I first cut it out. So, um, and then I just had a light bulb moment. And if you'll go to the next slide, I'll, I thought it was a good opportunity to throw the, uh, the TriStar in there as the, uh, in the sunset. So, um, and I think it came out for the best with that. And, uh, I think 
you go, I don't know what comes next after this, but, um, oh yeah, so this is just all the different files all in one place, which RDOSCAD does not like this. And if you try and work on anything in here, it'll crash. So this is just a master file where I pull something from into another drawing and uh, work on it. But um, in the- Is that what these things are? That's just something, some other project? Oh, no, that's the uh, the frame for it. Oh, okay. Because I don't know, once I got to this point, I I was like, I, the, all the fun work was had. So it was more just, you know, doing the grunt work to get it done. And I mean, it was pretty tricky. I've never made a frame quite like that before, but um, I think it did a good job. And above that is the, uh, the display base that I made for it with my little company plug in there <laughs> but uh it's uh currently sitting in our lobby and everyone's pretty happy with it and if you'll go into the next slide it'll be the uh finished product that looks so great uh, my corrugated cardboard knoxville skyline so it's a white a different sheet of cardboard and it just like alternates the uh brown and white or what yes um so any it goes it's 22 layers in total for that centerpiece yeah it's a lot of work but um yeah the each shadows look great too thank you yeah I, I took it outside to really get the, the shadow effect going but um yeah i'm pretty happy with it i think it turned out well and i'd be itching to get my hands on y'all's laser cutter and <laughs> see if i could make one of those out of it yeah out of wood, that'd be great too. That looks really great. I'm really impressed with it. Yeah. Cool. That's project. Thank you. Yeah. And last but not least, we have Ben. All He's right. Another new guy. Yes, thank you. Mine is not going to look anywhere near as nice as, as Nate's did. So well, it's differently uh, nice. It's differently nice. So uh, about a year ago, um, once I decided public places were a no go, uh, decided it was finally it was finally time to bite the bullet and uh, take the empty bedroom that I had in this craftsman that I've been living in. It's a hundred year old craftsman, as you can see, with hardwood floors, and this empty bedroom was always going to be a gym and I just never had gotten around to doing it and decided, you know, COVID being what it is, it's time to actually get that home gym made. So I needed to construct some things. Uh, not only this is a woodworking project in the sense that wood is involved and basically I needed to add some supports to the walls that would allow me to mount a folding power rack, which uh, I bought from Rogue Fitness. Uh, but before I could do that, I actually needed to, to secure the floor a bit better. And um, the laws of physics being what they are, it needed to stand up to a lot of weight in a very small impact area, which um, I'm, I wasn't convinced that these floors would do. So I, I don't have pictures of, of the first part of the project. You can see the, the finished work in later pictures, but uh, that entire room, I needed to lay down uh, several sheets of either underlayment that is used in subflooring, which this house does not have. It's just a hardwood floor over the top of uh, the original floor joists. Um, and for that, I used an underlayment that they, they use in modern homes for subflooring. I had to buy four pieces of underlayment and then the first layer went down in one direction. The second layer went down perpendicular to that so that the seams were across from each other and not lined up. And then on top of that, I put down a piece of plywood and on the sides of that added some heavy duty rubber mats. Um, and that is what made the floor and hopefully made it strong enough and will transfer enough weight across the entire floor rather than in specific spots where I might accidentally drop some weight. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, here you can see this is the heavy duty rubber mats on each side and the plywood um, 
in the middle um, after several coats of polyurethane. Uh, you can see the site supervisor there, Arlo, he is checking out the work. Um, but here I'm actually starting to build the assembly that the, the power rack ultimately connects to. And that is a two by 10 um, that I'm just basically, I've marked off the height where the power rack needs to connect for the bottom support and that blue painters tape is just marking where all the studs in the wall are and this project required i think on the order of 30 lag screws i'm sorry more like 40 lag screws um, for the two supports and other pieces that we'll see but here i'm putting up the bottom and i believe on the next slide you can see i've started to put together the top support and so everywhere there's a piece of blue painters tape, uh, that section of wall um, got drilled into and some two lag bolts in each spot, uh, basically because the power rack has to support the weight of a barbell plus the weight of all the weights plus um, the weight of the rack itself, which is kind of a heavy duty steel. Uh, so I had to spread that out across the wall because um, my girlfriend did not want a, a joist to get ripped out of the wall. Um, she was very specific on that. Don't, don't damage the floor, don't damage the walls. So uh, this is what I came up with to kind of transfer the weight out across the entirety of the wall, all of the joists behind the wall rather than in one particular spot. And if you go to the next side, you can see this is where the main uh, connectors are for the power rack. Um, at the bottom, uh, there are two struts that I've attached, and those had to be in very specific locations for the, the rack to set up properly, the, um, which is why the, those two by tens are where they are on the wall. And so there was a lot of measuring uh, seven or eight times uh, just to make sure that things actually uh, did go where they belong. And if we go to the next one, you can see this is what the actual final product is. The, uh, so those struts um, had to connect from the two by tens out to the main uprights. And there's some additional details on the power rack itself. I won't go into all the design of the power rack, uh, but this is what the final product looked like um, after that section. If you wanna go forward a slide. And you can see this is what it looks like when it's all folded up. So if you need more space in there, you can kind of take everything, break it down, fold it away. Uh, you do have to find a place to put all the other equipment. So I'm not really sure that uh, the folding aspect was necessary. And to be honest, I haven't actually folded it up ever after this picture was taken. Uh, if you want to go on to the next slide. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, it is a bit of a mess. I did add some shelves over there in the corner to hold some things. And I had to add another section of plywood to the front um, just to have everything be level. And if you wanna go one more, uh, this is what the finished product is on the inner wall. You can see I added two uprights, mainly to store things. Um, that piece on the right is a dip attachment on the left. That's a handle to attach to a barbell to do different exercises. Um, but I decided that since we are since we do have a bunch of ugly exposed wood on this wall, we'll go ahead and we'll just double down on it and add more uh, and bolt that into the wall as well. Uh, and overall, I've been pretty happy with it. It's, it's held up pretty well. If you wanna go one more slide. Um, and you can see this is the wall facing outside. Um, there is a lot of weight uh, being supported there. Um, and I reused some of the rubber matting um, over on the left-hand side to just, I had a lot left and it was pretty heavy duty. So I, I, I cut it up to different pieces and um, managed to use it to secure that bar against the wall there. So that's that was an extra bonus to keep that up and out of the way and at least to make sure it doesn't just fall over. <laughs> nice. And it hasn't ripped your wall down yet? It hasn't ripped the walls down yet. Um, the floor itself, I, it's held up to weights of, a, a barbell weights of about 380 pounds. I haven't actually dropped anything that heavy on it, um, but in terms of setting it down with enthusiasm, 
um, it actually does hold up pretty well. Um, I think you have a, one more slide of the. I do I'll have say. one more slide because yeah. I, you can never really be sure. Um, you can always add some more engineering. Uh, so basically under the house, I wanted to be double sure. And I added these posts on top of these mm -hmm. concrete uh, pillars to uh, basically add a little bit extra underneath just in case um, it could have, and, and the main purpose of this is I was pretty sure that the platform would hold up pretty well, um, but I wasn't 100% convinced that in that section that a shock uh, through the floor joist would be a good idea. So I wanted to add a bit more security and peace of mind um, that, you know, I wasn't going to actually crack the joist somehow. And that's what this picture is. Sure. And that, that is my, uh, the only woodworking project I currently have that I can share. Um, I, I hope to get some bookcases built and some other things, but uh, this is as good as it gets for right now. Nice. Thank you for sharing. I hope you can make more fun things in the future. I hope so as well. Thank you. All right, now announcements. Uh, we have coming up this Saturday. It is short notice, but if you are free this Saturday, Tim, who did a share for us tonight and has shown off his lathe stuff in the past, is doing a wood turning class this coming Saturday at 12 to 2.30. Um, it is $24.96 uh, members only, and you have to be off in the woodworking zone already. Uh, so if you haven't been off in the woodworking zone, you can talk to Brian, although I'm not really sure if you can get it in before Saturday. But hopefully Tim will offer it more than once, and it's going to be super popular. There's only four tickets, so get on there and get a ticket for this class. Uh, he, Tim is very talented. He showed off his lathe projects in the past, and uh, I think it'll be a really great class. And then, also coming up on hopefully June 8th, CDC willing, we will be meeting in person again. And hopefully we're going to have like a little gathering and party and we'll have really cool show and chairs in person in the classroom like we used to do way back when uh we're counting down the weeks that's only a month and a half away so get ready to burn your masks in the parking lot uh and we can gather in the space again soon so that is that is a countdown for that Again, if you'd like to share something, you can send it to us at sas at knoxmakers.org. If you'd like to donate, you can send money directly to us through knoxmakers.org slash donate, or you can set us as your nonprofit charity on Amazon or smile.amazon.com, and we'll get a little bit of cash from that with no extra work or money from you. And then we can get some money to support us. Uh, that's all I've got for tonight. Now we're going to close down the recording and open it up to social time. Still on the computer. And everyone have a great night.